That is good. Let me take my shoes off. When I went to India for the mission trip, whenever uh, people went up to preach, they took their shoes off. Sign of God's presence, honoring God and all those things. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This is sort of funny for me. Every year whenever we have a New Year's, every New Year's Eve we will gather and have a service. We have will break bread and have communion together and wash hands, wash, wash hands or feet. We began the year this way, but this year because New Year fell on Christmas, uh, Sunday, because having New Year's Eve service Saturday night, going into Sunday morning, but coming back for Sunday service will be maybe a little tired, but I realized everybody stopped anyway. We should have done it, but we didn't, we didn't have one. So I don't, know, I don't know what you did as you, be, as you, you, know, you began the New Year. What, I don't know what you did. So I, I sort of felt bad. I was last night finishing my sermon, I was on YouTube watching live, you know, that, uh, you know, the New Year thing in, 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 uh, in New York City that she's showing it, and I, I watch Fox News thing, See, and I, that's the only news station I just watch, and anyway, so watch, you know, Fox News, uh, New Year's, you know, um, whatever celebration, and you know, how they, they you know, what, uh, 10, 9, 8, whatever, and that I took a picture, a screenshot of the YouTube thing, anyway, so. That's, it is sort of bad to begin a year like that. But as we begin the new year, something about new brings hope and joy, right? I don't know what you, what you did as you began the new year. And you know, I don't know what kind of heart you set, what kind of posture you set for your life. I don't know what kind of things you have done differently today. If you think about it, it's nothing different from yesterday. It's just day change, that's it. We just call it a new, new year. But... I don't, know what, I don't know what you do, what you did. This morning when I woke up, you know, woke up, my, I set the alarm, alarm early than usual on Sunday. And, and really one of the first things I did, you know, which I do anyway, I want to begin with the word. Begin with Psalm 1. How blessed is a man. How blessed is a man. It goes on. And I spent some time waiting upon the Lord. Because what God says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I want to seek God first in my life and for the, especially New Year. Before I go on, let me ask, what are you following this year? What are you thinking? What are you setting your heart to follow this year? What are you trying to follow? Let me tell you, just give, give me two minutes and let me tell you a little story. This week, when summer with, my, I love to go anywhere with my wife. You know, usually my wife will go, the woman thingy, uh, her and her sister and mom will go up and never take me along. And this time around, I went with them. We went to this Chinese acupressure thing. And this is like six, you know, there was this $55 for six minutes. This guy come on back of his, and, you know, and, pray, and you know, I was, I was literally tear coming out, right? Like this, and he's pushing me all over the place. This is a good pain. And he was pushing on my leg and everything. He put, you know, told me to turn around, turn around. And he was massaging every part of my body. I went because, not because I like acupressure. I went because my wife said, let's go. I'll go where my wife wants to go. I love to go where she goes. Let me ask, who are you following this year? What are you following? Where are you, go, where are you, where are you going this year? That's the question. And there is a verse that I've been, I've been really praying for the last few years. One of the, my favorite verses from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as an unwise man, but as, way, as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. And do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In the same chapter, it says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. I pray that every Friday, Friday morning, how do I learn to please you, God? What, what does it mean to please you? How do I please you? That's the prayer. It, is, it has been one of my prayers for the last few years. Now, today's title of the message is, Go, I am sending you. I am reading probably the longest passage, probably in Sunday, ser Sunday sermon, 24 verses. Because there are 20 verses in, we're going to cover this today. 
I have so many slides. I do not worry, it won't be that long. I'm lying, okay. You do, do not trust her when pastor says you'll be sure. Okay, anyway, let's, let's all stand. Let's show our respect for the word of God. We'll read, we'll read Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 24 from ESV. You can follow along. You can see the screen up there. After this, the Lord appointed 22 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest, of the harvest, to send the laborers into his harvest. Verse 3, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in midst of the wolves. Verse 4, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Bless you. And, and, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. And if not, it will return to you. Verse 7, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer uh, deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe up against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Verse 13, this is really scary here. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you has been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But if it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades or hell. The one who hears you hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. A little more. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority. Let me read that again. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Here is a reading of the word of God. And God's people say, praise be to God, amen. You may be seated. It was long, wasn't it? Oh, you know, and this could have been three sermons. I wanted to put it together, and, and because in some way it is similar to the one we saw in first week of November. November and October, we looked at chapter 9 of Gospel of Luke. 
Now, we have, been, we have been in the gospel, look for one whole year. We went through nine chapters in one year. Hopefully, Jesus will come back before we finish Luke. We'll go into Luke chapter 10. And I really believe God put this passage as a first message for the year. He planned it this way. Fall fell on this special day. Now, and I, I'm not going to cover everything in the scripture passage today, but I want to look at and highlight a few things which is important to us. Let me pray. Father, I just come. We come before you right now. Father, we want more than our nice words. We want more than our very articulate, ear-tickling words. God, we want your truth. We want your presence. We want your life. We want your guidance, God. We want to see your face. So come, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We give you glory. We thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. What I'm going to do today, this, this afternoon, is that I want to share God's word out of this passage. And also in the midst of it, I'm going to interject in some places some of the word God is giving me for this year. So that's what I'm doing. So I want you to, I want, hopefully you'll be able to catch some of those. Now, how many of you have, how many of you have and how many of you have NIV Bible? How many of you, does anybody have a New King James Version? New King James Version? Okay. Okay. Does anybody have an NASB? Translation. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about the, the you're using right now, NASB. The reason I'm saying is because in chapter 10, verse 1, there is a lot of controversy in this verse 1. Some Bible will say 70. Some Bible will say 72. ESB says 72. My favorite Bible version, NASB says 70. And when you look, when it's a, I'm going to do a little bit, of the, the, little bit of Bible history and theology here. Let me, hopefully you'll be able to get, get it. Let me explain a little bit. There are over 40,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Some whole, some little short, small pieces dating back to first century. And, you know, and they have so many. And some of the older manuscripts are more weighty in their, more in their importance than the others. So usually sometimes in the Bible you find few places where there might be little divergences, little change differences. But this is one of those where many of the good manuscripts going back to first, second, second century use has 20, 70 on it. Some, are, some other as good or even more authoritative verses Equal amount says 72. And, I, for me, and so that some Bible translate, older translations in English used to say 70. Now more new ones will say 72. Now for me, even that, I see God's mercy in it, power in it. Number 70 is a very important number in the Bible. And number 70 is a very important the number in the Old Testament. There were 70 elders with Moses around the mountain. There were 70 members of the Jacob's family that went to Egypt. 70. And, and the 70 years Israel was in, in exile in Babylon. 70 was a very important number. And, and also even the Sanhedrin, the leaders of you know, uh, in the, in Israel in the time of Jesus, Sanhedrin had 70 elders. Being the judge, whatever. 70 is very important. You'll find 70... Over 60 times in the Bible. Very important number. 72, not as much. Not as much. But, interestingly, in chapter 10 of Genesis, talks about what they call table of nations. They, the they, Bible says every nation in the world language comes out of descendants of Noah, three sons. And then they name 70 nations. And, and, and their peoples, they come out. But in Septuagin Greek translation of the Old Testament has 72 in it. Okay, in, in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament says 70. Greek translation of the Old Testament says 72. And so, so when you look at, so this number 7 is important, but the 70 or 72 seem to be pointing, either number pointing to table of the nations. Why is this important? This is important because 
Remember, a chapter early, chapter 9, Jesus sent out 12 disciples to go and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. Now here, Jesus sends out another 70 or 72. Send them out to, to do what the apostles did before. If 12 is a number of the tribes of Israel, meaning the gospel going, the word of God is going to the Israel. Now, if that 70, 72 going out is symbolic of saying the word of God is going to all the nations and the peoples of the world. Of course, there are more than 70 now. But they are saying you can chase all back to the 70 nations and what, uh, languages, whatever it might be. So here, Jesus is doing something. You know, just a just few, few, few days ago, Jesus went up to the mountain of transfiguration and, and he, you know, to pray. There he saw Moses and Elijah appearing and speaking with him. They're talking about how Jesus will go to Jerusalem to die and shed his blood. And then Jesus come down to the mountain and, tell the, and told the disciples about how he's going, to have, he's going to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And then right before this passage, he talked about people saying, we're going to follow you. Jesus said, you know, the foxes have holes, the birds have a nest, but son of man have nowhere to lay his head. And he told other people, follow me. And they said, can I bury my dad first? No. And, and, and can, can I say bye to my parents? No. You follow after me. Then he goes on to talk about choosing not just the 12 apostles, but 70 or 72 people to go for. Listen, this is very important. Why is this important? I think a lot of, a lot of us even still think, at least in the back of our mind, God's work is done by special people, some specially chosen people. Yeah, God's work is, should be done by pastors and maybe missionaries and prophets and all those people. We think like that. We may not say it, but we in the back, we think that way. You know, when you pray for people to be healed, we want to be prayed by the pastor or the preacher. I remember me, I went to Korea, to Korea with Pastor about the prophetic guy. Man, you know, went out to the ministry. Pastor about taught, and there were six of us in Korea. Pastor about we are lined, right? Six stations, about three, four hundred people coming to pray. We pray for every single one of them. You know what people do? Even though I prayed for them and they were touched by God, they want to all go to be blessed by Pastor Bob. They go back on that line. Everybody goes to that line, Pastor's line. Some of you think that God's anointing, God's power is in the special chosen people of God. That, um, that's, that, that's not totally wrong. But some of you think that, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm nobody. The 12 apostles he sent out had names. The 70, 72, we don't know any of their name at all. He chose them to go and do the same thing the apostles did. To go out and heal the sick. Tell them the kingdom of God is coming. And they, and, and they saw people, demons you know, uh, cast out and everything. You, you saw that in the passage. Listen, this is important. We still struggle these days as Christians, we think, some people are more anointed than the others. And that I am not good enough. I, I, I'm nobody. How can God use me? And somehow we negate that. Yet God says to each and every child of God and sons and daughters of God, believers, he has given Holy Spirit to live in you. Same God, the Spirit of God lives in every single child of God. He has given every single child of God authority to heal. And he has given us invitation to speak the word of God. Yes, some are, some are a little more anointed there. They see more. The power of God shows in their life. That doesn't mean I shouldn't. We are all called to be his light and the salt. Amen? This is important. This is important. You know, I tell you this this. This week, I drove about with Brian and Brock to, to a retreat that I wanted some of our youth to go called Identity Retreat. And in New Jersey, when I arrived on, uh, on Wednesday morning, which was the last full day, when I arrived just the time when Abby was preaching. My daughter, Abby, was preaching. And, I, and walking, so she was almost end of her message. And she actually said, this is for my dad. And she's quoting me. And she preached the mes message. And she had an altar call. 
Many accept Christ. Many repent, many turn to God. They had really powerful ministry time. My young daughter, school teacher, English teacher, okay? But God was using her. I think she's not better than me. She, she sounds so crisp. Her words are concise, not like her dad. And she, God was using her. She's not, a, she's not a pastor, ordained pastor, or anything like that. But God was using her. Hey, listen very carefully. This is important. The past few years, God is speaking to a church. Last year, God said, Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me out to or the, you know, bind up the broken hearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and, and freedom to the prisoners, all that. And God said, I'm anointing you. I'm sending you out here. This year, God is saying, I am sending all of you, not some, but all of you out. You need to understand what that means. He's saying, all of you, I'm sending you out. I wrote, a, I wrote down on my journal. Jesus, come and follow me. He said, come and follow me. And, you know, and this is because I was, I'm over there. So I'm, so I'm following him. After a while, you know what? I'm walking with him. Now, his, his calling is not just follow me. He says, walk with me on the side. Walk with me. Now I am walking with him. And God says, join in what I'm doing. Participate. Why don't, let's do things. As you're going with him, he says, you, know, you, you get to know his heart. What is in his heart. What he loves. What he delights in. Begin to see what moves his heart. Begin to see, feel what he wants. And he said, God's got, you know, as he's doing things, as he's going, as you walk with him, as you follow, as you walk with him, he says, I want you to take part in what I'm doing. This is what God is saying. Jesus is saying, I am going to Jerusalem to die to save this world because I love them. As you're following, as you go with me, I want you to do and take part in what I'm doing. I want you to do what I'm doing. That's what Jesus is doing. Calling God's people to say, go, I am sending you. Amen? Go, I'm sending you. Some did go, for you, even for our church, to Bangkok. Some went to Izmir. Some went to different places, you know, and, and yet many of us are going, maybe not overseas. You need to be going to your workplace. You need to go to your, even, your, even your homes. There has to be a place where God's kingdom, God's goodness has to come. You, you are going every place in this world. So first mistake we think is only some people are called to do it. No. Everybody is called, invited in to God's kingdom together. Second thing is that not only that there is no special mission, play, mission field, every place where we live has to be where God comes. Our workplace, our company, God needs to come. Our home, God needs to come. Our neighbor, God needs to come. And our school, God needs to come. Definitely in our school, God needs to come. God is sending to every one of those places. Why? Because Jesus said here, he's sending them out to where he was coming. See, he's sending you wherever you go. He said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go where you ever go. He sends you out so that he will come over there. He's coming. And, and so he, then he talks about, I, I don't know the notes anymore. Okay, forget the notes here. Okay. I am, okay. Where am I? Okay. So many. As he's, he's going, he, and he's sending them out to where he's going to come. And he talks about those who will accept him, those who will those reject him. He said, I'm sending you out as lambs among the wolves. Listen. So I'm sending you out not as a lion to go and pounce and devour people. No, I'm sending you as lambs, helpless lambs among the wolves. When he said, I'm sending you out, he said, it's not because it's easy. It'll be difficult. There'll be wolves out there who will bite your neck, bite your leg, whatever. It'll be out there saying, it won't be easy. But Jesus was the lamb of God that was slain. He, he, if he came as a lamb of God and who was slain for our sake, he said, I'm sending you like me as lambs among the wolves. Expect it. There will be difficulty out there. Listen, if you, are, if you are in social media, a lot of people are. I bet the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up, 
Right? Right? First thing you did in the morning. Or is it the Bible? I, 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 yeah, right. You, I know you do this. First thing in the morning, you, you do this. You know, and when you do social media, I had, you know, I, you know early days on the social media, I thought that the like buttons are cute. Not anymore. At least I don't have a I hate you button. Actually, some of them does, he has an angry face on it, right? You know, and people, you know, people get so bent out of say because somebody doesn't like what you say and they criticize you on social media, people you, you don't even know. Who cares? Who cares? But Jesus said, I'm sending you as, as lamb among the wolves, meaning it will be dangerous for you to speak and take God's word. And he says, when those, there will be those who will be, accept you and receive you and those who will reject you. And, and the, the message is both case is the kingdom of God has come near to you. That's the same message. To those who receive you, accept you, you heal the sick and you declare the kingdom of God is near. And those who reject you and you dust your feet off against them and, and say, you know what, I want you to know this. I'm leaving, but I want you to know the kingdom of God has come near to you. Meaning, you have rejected the kingdom of God. And then Jesus says, it will be more bearable on that day of judgment. For the Sodom and Gomorrah, where the two cities were destroyed by God's wrath for their sinful sin in the city, sinful people, sin in the wickedness in the city, that yours, they will be more bearable than you guys who rejected the message. Listen, when you carry God's message, you are carrying something significant. Jesus said, if they, if they accept you, they're accepting me. If they reject you, they're rejecting me. You see how important this is? Uh, but we, we have to be careful. But, you know, if they reject me, so when they reject you, they are not rejecting you, they're rejecting me because I sent you. And when they're rejecting me, they're rejecting the one who sent me, the Father God. That's how serious this is. I, I skip one of the passages, you know, which is verse 2. Jesus said, and, and Jesus said the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, the Lord of the harvest will send out more laborers into the field. And if you look at, you know, if you, I, don't, I don't know if you have time. And you look at those passages and study, the word sent out comes out three times in the first two verses, three verses. There are two different words used. One is apostello, almost like apostles. One is sending you out as an you know, ambassador. And here the word is, it is God, the Lord of harvest to send out, oh, ekbalo. This is the word used to cast out demons. This is the word that's very forcibly push them in. And God says here, Jesus says here, there are a lot of harvests ready. They're ready. You don't have enough people working. You don't have enough people laboring in the field. Ask God the Father to send out, impel, compel more laborers to go in. And then he sends his people out. Right? He sends them out. Okay, so listen. How does everything here it begins with prayer? You pray. You pray the Father God, the God, Lord of the harvest, Father God will send more workers into the field. And, and as you pray, you may become the answer to your prayer. You may become the prayer, answer to the prayer. I know, I think this is what happened with Sue and Christina. They've been visiting, you know, they've been going to uh, Thailand for many years. They've been going there for like almost 10 years. Sometimes twice a year they went out. And they pray for the people. You know, and I know they love those people, pray for them. And, they, and, and at the end, they became the answer to God's prayer. They went out. They became the answer to the prayer they've been praying to God about. God sent them out there. The prayer is one of the, one of the things God has been really speaking to my heart this year. I don't know if I have the verse in there. Um, one of, the, one of the first God has spoken to me is this. If you, if you have time, we can meditate on it a little bit. Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7. God is speaking to me about God is calling. 
As God sends people out, God calls us to pray first. He says, on your words, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourself and give him, give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Here is a, so he, Isaiah is prophesying, saying, God is appointing a watchman, a, a one who will wa be watching and praying on the wall. The watchman is on the wall because when the enemy comes, they are the ones who are seeing, oh, enemy is coming. They'll blow the trumpet, oh, enemy is coming, get ready. So God is, I'm putting the watchman on the, on the wall, which is into prayer warriors, prayer warriors to pray. And you know, as you pray, he says, do not rest for yourself. Do not give God a rest. Keep asking the God, asking God to do what you said you would do, God. Do what you said you would do. Do what you said you would do, God. God, you will establish your people, Jerusalem, your city, Jerusalem, God. I believe there is a call to prayer. I believe some of you, it is a call to prayer. You know, I told you about a couple, about a couple of weeks ago, I went over to fast about eight, seven, eight days because God gave me the word. Come up here and I'll show you the things which it must take place. I feel like God is calling me to prayer. And, in, and this coming week, Wednesday to Saturday, we have PPP. And I, wa I want to invite some, as a lot of you, if you can, fast a little bit. A meal a day, two meals a day, three meals a day for four days. Fast and pray. Ask God. Ask God what is in his heart. Ask God to send more laborers into the field. We need more laborers in every arena of life. We need more laborers in the school system. We need more laborers in, even in politics, we need, we, we need laborers in every part of this life. We need people who will go in the name of Jesus, carrying his goodness and gospel, living that out. And so, uh, Pastor Mimi and I and Pastor Jason, we, are, we will be praying throughout the whole time. And, if, and we ask all the house church uh, shepherds, let us know who is coming that night. So that we will be, uh, I'm, I'll be asking, asking God for words for you, a, a word for your family, a word for your house church, whatever. I'll be, we'll be praying, and, and we will share the word with you, pray with you. And if you'll pray for every single one who asks for prayer each night. I'll be very honest. I feel good about this. When I went to Korea uh, about three years ago with the water revival guys in Georgia, when I had to minister out there, every night we had, we had about 400 people so we were praying for them. Every single one who came to be prayed for, God gave me a word for them. Every single one, God gave me a word for the person. My wife was helping me out, and she got a word for each person, and we ministered. I remember the, the last night we were there, we were, we were about almost ready to leave. This one person said this, said, oh, you know, you are so prophetic. Me, prophetic? I don't think. And I said, and, but God, God was giving the words. I really believe God is giving the words. And you see God passionately pursuing God's presence for this year. He'll give you, he will give us, he'll give you words and promise for this year. Amen? I believe God will do that. All right, let, let me, I'm going to Skip a lot of things that I want to mention. Just a couple more things. In verse, I believe, uh, 17, uh, the, uh, they, after they go out and they preach the gospel, they heal the sick, and they come back. They come back, and they return with joy. In verse 17, the 22, 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They came say, uh, saying, and Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. And Jesus says, when they come in, they're excited. They're talking about all that they've done. They preach, and people, you know, got healed. The demons are cast out, and people are opening their hearts to the, the message of the kingdom. This is not Peter and Paul and apostles. This is nobody's. It's the nameless people, the followers of Christ, who went out, and they're coming back. Hey, 
Jesus, we see all those things. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. They saw God move and they had great joy. Listen, the word God is giving me, the word God is giving me was, guys, God is sending all of us out, taking his word out there. We will see a lot of joy this year. We will see a lot of fruit this year. We will see a lot of, you know, the God's signs and wonders doing in our midst. And, and, and they're, they're, I believe God's promising us that. And they'll come back with joy. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. You know, I don't know, often we do not know this. When he even do a little thing in the name of Jesus, when he shares God's love and grace with people, we don't see it, but Jesus says, I see Satan falling down from heaven. There's something happening in the spiritual realm that you do not see, but God's work is being done. God's power is coming. God's kingdom is coming. Amen? You think you, think you just gave a bowl of water? No, it's, no, you have done in the name of Jesus. God is honored. God's kingdom come. That's what Jesus is saying. Something is happening. You do not know, but it's happening. And, you know, and, and some of us, I know, I, I'm declaring that some of us, as you do, as you go and do be faithful in wherever you are, and doing it in God's name, and you know, and being open to any chances, opportunity God gives you to share his love and share his grace, you'll find your anointing God has given you increase. You begin to see God move and stir. Amen? Those who say amen will receive it. Praise the Lord. Amen? And, and then some, Jesus said something very interesting. He says in, in the verse uh, 20, he says, Nevertheless, yes, you are rejoicing great. I saw Father do amazing things through you. And he says, nevertheless, I want you to have a right joy. Yes, you are joyful about what even demons being bound by the name of Jesus. Yes, you, have joy, so you are joy, excited about what God, God did through you. Those are great. But Jesus said, nevertheless, I want you to rejoice because your names are written in heaven. More than all the things you do, or have done, those are great. You are, you, you are, it's okay for you to be rejoicing in those you should, but greater joy has to be in the fact that your names are written in, the, in heaven. Who, write, who writes your name in heaven? Not me. God writes it in heaven. When did he write it? When did he write it? Not when you believe in Jesus. No, he wrote it. Even before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, verse 4. Even before God created everything, your name was already written in heaven. That's what you need to be joyful about. You see, our successes, some of the good testimony that comes, comes and goes. Okay? It doesn't stay. Not only that, some, and those are as good as it is, it is not permanent. And yet, the true joy at the end that will last is the fact that God the Father knows your name. Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name performed many miracles. They did all those things. But Jesus says to them, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. All those things are great. We can rejoice in it. But the greatest joy is the fact that God knows me. My name is written in heaven. He knows me. He knows me. He cares about me. He loves me. The reason he allows me to be part of what he's doing is because he loves me. Not, not because he needs me. God don't need me. God doesn't need me. God, he can do whatever he needs to do without me. But he's allowing me to be part with him. For our sake, our joy. I wanna, this is the tough word I want to speak in. And I think this is a great blessing in it. God has been really stirring in my heart. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. I don't know how many even remember that verse. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 and 30, it says, 
For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same, uh, same conflict you saw in me and now here to be in me. You know, one of the greatest privilege is, is when God says, you know what? I want you to share my, I want, I want you to share me. And as I walk along, God, God says, you want to see what, what's happening. God allows me to feel what is feeling. God allows me to feel his sorrows. God allows me to partake in his even suffering. I, I, I don't know, some, maybe, maybe very, very few of you are here from, I think, a number of years ago when, we, when our Hope Church experienced outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I still remember at the time, very prophetic moments that we saw was that there was some, some prophetic words that came out, which needed to be a little bit more filtered, where there were a lot of prophetic words about suffering, people, people suffering for Christ. I remember a person who was in the spirit, experiencing the spirit of God moving in him. He would look at people and begin to weep. He saw people suffering for Christ. This is a big, I don't think this is a difficult word. One of the prayers I pray, God, will, will you grant me the privilege even to suffer for you? It's easy to pray, God, I want to see, I want to experience your power and your blessings. I want to see, experience your resurrection. But what about Apostle, when Apostle Paul said, to share in his suffering? God, will you grant me share in your suffering? To see his victories. God, I want to experience your sufferings as well. Jesus said, go. I send you like lamb among wolves. Your joy, Jesus says, you should be in. In fact, your names are written in, 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 in heaven. I just want one more thing. Can you come to like, I think, the fourth slide from the, at the end, there's a little picture right in there, right? I don't know if you have seen this. Okay, you are this. I'm revealing something that only the session members know. Okay, what do you, do you see? So what do you see here? Do you see P, I, D, in the in the fish, right? You see, the whole point of today's message really is lost people matter to God. All, all lost people matter to God. God cares about all people, those who are lost, who are perishing. This is why he's going to the cross in Jerusalem to die for them, to save them. He's inviting us to join in. Lost people matter to God. Three things he's inviting us to do. First, pray for them. Second, invite them. To trust in Christ, invite them to draw near, invite them to your house church, invite them even to church, invite them into your life. Third, help them grow in Christ, follow Christ, disciple, because laws, people matter to God. I'm almost done. I think last two, two slides are just a couple of verses, promises, the words that God gave. For the Son of Man, Jesus said, came. To seek and save the lost. That's what Christ came to do for us. He came to seek and save the lost. He's inviting us to take part in it. Why? Because God so loved the world. That's you and me and the world. So that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says, Go. I'm sending you as lamb among wolves. He's inviting us. And we have a praise team come up. We'll have a, our communion ushers get ready for the communion. I'm so excited. I'm so happy that we can begin the year with communion together. I'm going to put on my white robe.
going to end the service with a prayer, but I know God is speaking to many of you. If you want to respond to that God's prompting, I want to invite you to come and we'll pray with you to ask his anointing over you. I want to invite you to come. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be upon all who say yes to his calling to go and follow him. Be upon Hope Church. Be upon all those who call upon his name from now until forever and ever. Amen. Amen.